Um, we would like to welcome Amanda Stenrus. Amanda Stenrus is our, our violin soloist this morning, and the prelude for this morning's service is, we're switching the postlude and the prelude. The, uh, the prelude is Polish Dance by Edmund Severn.
You guys know how hard that makes it for me to follow that? <laughs> Thanks a lot. Man. You know, I've been doing this for a lot, a lot of years, and it's hard to find church musicians. And I don't know where, I don't know if they hang out at the same restaurants, the same coffee houses. How do you guys keep coming? You come up with all these wonderful musicians. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was wonderful. All right, so we set the bar high. So wherever you are on your spiritual journey in the spirit of summer, you are welcome here to join other fellow travelers. And so on a very gorgeous summer day, after a horrible, horrible hot week, maybe even more than a week, you are welcome here at Hatfield Congregational Church. And as we now be, begin our worship with our call to worship, I ask you to please turn to your bulletins. Great is our God and greatly to be praised. Worship the one whose grace covers all of our needs. Ponder God's steadfast love in his temple. Practice sharing that love while we are together. We are here to be equipped for the journey of life. We have gathered that our witness to the world may be empowered. Praise be to God. Amen. Let us now join together in our unison prayer. God of the faithful and those who are seeking, you are our faithful guide. We invoke your presence among us at this time. Your name is proclaimed through all the earth, and by your hand we were made, and made in your holy image. When we ponder your greatness, we are filled with awe and also humbled by what you believe we can be and what we can do. When we come together in your house, we are grateful to be invited so close. We hope to hear your prophetic word that calls us to build your realm. Come, Spirit of Truth, to show us your way. Amen. Well, let us now join together and offer our gift of song from Blue Hymnal number 344, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus. joy of this place, let us exchange with each other the gift of peace.
I could invite our young people to come forward. Grab my chair first. All right. Summer going well so far? You look tanned. And 12 years old, congratulations. You're almost a teenager. And that's when, well, us adults don't look as cool as we do right now because we're cool right now, right? Right? Yeah, all right, maybe it starts earlier than I thought. All right, well, welcome here to Hatfield Congregational in the middle of summer, and I hope you're having a good time. You're going to be downstairs talking about environment, was what I heard from uh, um, our, our director over there, Mrs. Wilson. And uh, when you go downstairs to talk about environment, I just want to tell you about something you're going to miss here, which is a reading from Paul, who's writing to a church in an old city called Corinth. And over in Corinth, he was having trouble. The, the congregation wasn't really listening to him. And so Paul had to tell them about some of the special things that gave him the, the authority to, to speak in Jesus' name. And reading that, we're going to do a little bit later. That guy right there, Ed Keefe, is going to read it for us. And he talks about the fact that someone, he doesn't even use his own name. He doesn't say, I had this vision. He just says someone, because he's trying to be humble. But he says, I had a vision 14 years ago. Now, none of you guys even remember 14 years ago, because not even the oldest one, he was 14 years old. But 14 years ago for Paul, because he's had so many amazing things happening in his life as he's working for Jesus, 14 years ago was a long time ago, but it was like yesterday. And he says, I was taken up. He says, I don't know if I was in my body or out of my body. He says, I simply do not know. He says, somehow I went up to third heaven. I have no idea what first heaven is. I have no idea what second heaven is. I have no idea what third heaven is. But Paul says, I was taken either in my body or out of my body, and I went up to third heaven. And you know what he tells us about heaven? Nothing. He actually says, the things that I saw cannot be told. So he has this mysterious, I don't even know what you call it, more than a vision. It was just an experience. And he gets transported up into heaven, and the things that he saw, he cannot tell us about. And so that kind of tells me that heaven is for later. Okay, heaven is not something that we really need to worry about now. Something we can hope in, it's something we can believe in, but it's not something we really need to worry about because heaven is going to be so other, so different, that we really can't put it into words. We can't experience it. Paul didn't know if he was in his body, out of his body. He couldn't say anything about it. So heaven is for later. I think what God wants us to do is think about here and now before we go to heaven. And that's why when Mrs. Wilson has got your class to, in, for Sunday school about the environment, that's really important because this is our gift. You know, this whole world is our gift. And as Christians, we're not only locked in pretty boxes. That whole world was made by God, it says. And if that world is God's gift, then that world is supposed, we're supposed to take care of it. One of the things I'm going to quickly mention is that Adam was created and put in Eden to take care of God's paradise. And so ever since then, we've had this job of taking care of the environment. So we can't just take and take and take and use and use and use. We have to take care of that wonderful gift of the environment. And somehow God counts that as part of our faith. Not the whole kit and caboodle of our faith, but as part of our faith. That what we do here in this world counts towards going to heaven. Heaven is going to be glorious, but that's for later. Right now, we've got to concentrate on here and now. And like you're going to learn about in your Sunday school uh, meetings downstairs, take care of the environment. You know, if you, you got a plastic bottle or something, take care of it. You know, throw it in the recycle bin or even don't even use the plastic bottle. Or, you know, if you can get somewhere on a bike or walking instead of uh, taking the car, do that. Or I'd even love, I'm trying, Sharon, where are we trying to go for a walk up by the reservoir or something? 
I want to go for a walk up by Hatfield's Reservoir, up off a mountain road. I'm afraid because I've asked all these different people about how to get up there and how to get back, and I've heard 10 different stories. So I'm afraid that Sharon and I are going to be walking through the woods aimlessly forever for the rest of the summer. So I would love to take some of you guys to get lost with us so that we can go and maybe take a walk sometime this summer. So if you ever want to go take a walk sometime this summer and show me where the reservoir is, Sharon and I and my dog Mason, we would love that. We just took a walk up in Vermont uh, yesterday with our dog. It's beautiful being out in nature, in the environment. Take care of it. You know, go out there, enjoy yourself, and maybe even show me where that reservoir is. Okay? Deal? All right. Happy birthday again. Have a great Sunday school class talking about the environment.
Thank you again. Now time for our joys, our celebrations, and our concerns. I'd like to begin with a uh, prayer of thanksgiving for a uh, quick trip to the hospital that turned out to be negative, and so we appreciate God for that gift there. We also offer prayers for two dear ladies uh, up in Deerfield, uh, Jane and Peg, who are struggling with cancer and also with its treatments. Also, prayers for Gene Sheehan, who is undergoing his cancer treatments, as you know. Please keep him and his wife, Marcia, in your prayers. Also, prayers for Sue Gilman, as you know, who has, I think, completed radiation treatments and now must begin her uh, chemo treatments for her cancer. Please keep Sue in your prayers as well. Any other joys? Yes. Oh, they did? Oh, wonderful. <laughs> there. Well, thank you for sharing that. Uh, we all hope so. That's absolutely for sure. Any other prayers? Okay. Then let us also take just this opportunity of a few moments of silence uh, to be alone with Jesus in the privacy of our own temple of our bodies, uh, to listen to him and also to speak to him. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your steadfast commitment to all of us. We offer you our praise. May it reach the highest heaven, even the third highest heaven, and to the ends of the earth as well. But most especially, may it abide sincerely in our hearts, our minds, and our souls, because you dwell within each and every one of us. It is in that intimacy of faith that we trust our prayers to you, that they are heard, and we pray that we may be attentive enough to hear your prayers for us as well. Please join us now in reciting together the prayer that Jesus taught us, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We are always eager to receive, but somewhat a little bit more reluctant to give. Jesus Christ turned those priorities right around, giving thanks for the generosity of God's covenant with humanity and also for finding great joy in his opportunity to share. In imitation of our Savior, we are invited to bring our offerings to be placed before God and then to empower our ministry in his name.
Accept, O oh Lord, these gifts now to be placed in your sanctuary as our help in doing your work in our world. May these gifts multiply through your grace so we may accomplish all good. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I'd ask you now to uh, turn to Blue 452, Here I Am, Lord, which happened to be one of the songs or hymns that was sung at my ordination.
The first reading comes to us from 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 2 through 10. I know a person in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that such a person, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows, was caught up into the paradise and heard things that are not to be told, that no mortal is permitted to repeat. On behalf of such a one, I will boast, but on my own behalf, I will not boast, except of my weaknesses. But if I wish to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it, so that no one may think better of me than what is seen in me or heard from me, even considering the exceptional character of the revelations. Therefore, to keep me from being too elated, a thorn was given to me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I appealed to the Lord about this, that it would leave me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. So, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. And today's gospel is going to be taken from Mark's gospel, chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. Now Jesus left that place and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, Jesus began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. And they said, where did this man get all of this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor except in their hometown, and among their own kin, and in their own house. And he could do no deed of power there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. And then Jesus went about among the villages teaching. He called the twelve and began to send them out now two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. And Jesus ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. And he said to them, Wherever or whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you, as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as testimony against them. And so they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. You know, it's good to see you here today because we went through literally a killer of a heat wave this past week. Over at Yankee Candle, my other job, I was telling my co-workers, and this didn't go over so well, that we shouldn't even accept pay because it was so nice to be in that air-conditioned building. And for all of the people complaining all winter about the snow, you should have seen how happy the guests were when they had that fake snow coming down inside the building. They all waited for that four minutes when that snow would come down. It was that hot outside that even fake snow inside felt good. And that heat and the humidity made it feel like it was 100 or more degree degrees day after day after day. It's got to be. It's got to be at least 20 degrees cooler in here this Sunday than it was last Sunday. And for that, we can and we should be grateful that it's better. You know, it would be wonderful if things could be perfect, and perfect was the norm all the time, but that's not going to happen. Perfect was never, ever the norm. 
even the Bible realizes that we humans are more at home in this kind of natural setting than we ever were in Eden's paradise. In the Bible's second creation story, which is completely different than the Bible's first creation story, we're told that God formed Adam out of the dust of the ground. Then God planted the Garden of Eden. Then God took this Adam formed from the dust of the earth and he dropped him inside of Eden. Adam was the first immigrant. We are all ancestors of immigrants. We were never supposed to be in Eden. God took us from one place and dropped us in another, and we were not welcome there. We did not work out well there. We got thrown out of there. We were, we were forbidden to go back in there. But for the rest of that chapter, there's a little bit of talk of paradise. But for the rest of the Bible, there is no more perfect. It's all about better. Not perfect, but better. And this message comes across for us in today's two readings. St. Paul shares with us the fact that he had some sort of a, a physical ailment that restricted his ability to be able to work for Christ and for church. And then later, in his letter to the Galatians, he again mentions this ailment, something that's holding him back. And this time, though, he gives us a little hint. He offers this compliment to the Galatians. He says, had it been possible, you would have torn out your very own eyes and given them to me. In Romans, Paul thanks a guy named Tertius for actually writing the letter because he was like his secretary, because somehow Paul wasn't able to write. In later writings like Colossians and 2 Thessalonians, Paul draws attention at the very end of his letter that this I sign with my own hand. So again, there must have been a secretary, and then authenticity was Paul's signature, maybe in big block letters at the very end of the epistle because he just didn't seem to have the ability to write. So maybe there was something that Jesus, either Paul was blind or almost blind that he could not see. And can you imagine Paul having to travel all over that Roman Empire and he could not see, or maybe he couldn't see at all that he was completely blind? That would have been that thorn in the flesh that he prayed to Jesus three times, remove this from me. And he's not being selfish. If you remove this from me, I can do my job better for you. And then Jesus comes along in a vision from heaven. And he says to Paul, that's not going to be in your cards, Paul. You're going to have to learn how to deal with this imperfection. And then you can rely on me more. Perfect is not to be your gift, but you can be better with me. So again, that idea of perfect is not in our cards, but the idea of better is always there. Or think about the gospel that I just shared. Jesus had been raised in Nazareth. Then he moves down to Capernaum after he comes back from John the Baptist, and that's down by the Sea of Galilee. Now, for some reason, he goes back to Nazareth. And as he goes back to Nazareth, he goes there on a Sabbath. And on the Sabbath, he's invited to preach in their synagogue. And Jesus is referred to as the carpenter. Not the carpenter's son. The later Gospels, they try to kind of take a little bit of the edge off. They don't want to call Jesus the carpenter. They call him the carpenter's son. But Mark, the first Gospel, the one that's a little bit more brash, he just says right out, Jesus was the carpenter. Maybe these people who were sitting there in that synagogue with Jesus, maybe they bartered with Jesus so that he would work for them. Maybe these people traded fish or grain or cloth or something so that Jesus would come and share his skills with them. And they still have Jesus' family living right in that village. They name all the sons by name. There's a bunch of them. And then they just say, and his daughters. And his sisters, I mean. I guess sisters, the females, they didn't even merit the time of having a name mentioned. But there's brothers, there's sisters, there's Mary. They're all living there in Nazareth. And there's really nothing exceptional about them, says these people in the synagogue. And it's hard to move from that kind of familiarity he used to be our carpenter. I lived down the street from his brother. I married, my sister married his brother, and my brother married his sister. How in the world do you go from that kind of familiarity to thinking of Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of God, the Savior of the entire world? And so they simply could not. They would not. And it says in the Bible, Jesus was amazed at their unbelief. And not that he chose not to do any miracles, he could not do any miracles because they simply put up these walls and he could not do any miracles there amongst them. Now this is far, far from perfect. And we're talking about Jesus' own example. But rather than linger over this setback, Jesus doubles down on his efforts. First says the gospel, 
Jesus doesn't stay there and dwell on all of these things. He moves on. He starts preaching to other villages that are maybe more receptive. And then for the first time in the gospel, Jesus also sends out others, the disciples, to also start preaching this gospel message about repentance before God and forgiveness and love and all those wonderful things that we still preach now 2,000 years later. So Jesus was turned away by the people of Nazareth in that synagogue. He moved on and continued his work, and he actually increased the, the, pro, the, uh, the proclamation by sending out others as well. It's not about perfect. It's about better. Perfect is never going to happen. That's fairy tales. Religion is not fairy tales. What we need to do is work for better, not for perfect. The Bible begins by telling us that we weren't created in paradise, and we sure as heck didn't stay there. We got thrown out and were never allowed back in. Paul and Jesus both show us that even when you're doing the work and the will of God, that perfect is not as powerful as better. In other words, obstacles, roadblocks, detours, setbacks, none of these are excuses to stop in our tracks or turn around and just give up and say, I tried God, there's nothing I can do. It's never going to be perfect. It's never going to be easy. And those are never going to be excuses in the eyes of God. Our calling as Christians is not only to imagine and hope for that someday perfect, that perfect that Paul experienced up in that third heaven, in or out of the body. He doesn't know things that he can't even talk about. If you can't talk about them or explain them, then they really aren't meant for us now. They're for later. What we have to do is concentrate on here and now. And so our here and now is not to make this heaven perfect. That's not going to happen. I wish it would, but it's not going to happen. Our job is to try to make things better. I just shared this past week on our Facebook page a, a message from a, a famous preacher and a theologian, and uh, he's a seminary teacher down south, Walter Brueggemann. And he calls out churches with this same message of working to try to make things better. It's wonderful that you're here on a beautiful day. I mean, there are so many other things that each and every one of us could be doing, but you chose to set aside a little bit of time for Jesus, and that's important. But Brueggemann wants to make sure that we don't lock church in pretty buildings. And so he goes back to the prophets to make his case. He talks about Jerusalem kings, and these guys were not always the best. And the temple and its priests were there to legitimate the king and his dynasty. And the words that Brueggemann uses are, this was all blessed by a very anemic God. But standing out from that status quo were the prophets. These guys were a little bit strange sometimes. They did weird things, and they just had no, they had no reason to be preaching to priests and kings and everybody else, and yet they did. They had imagination, says Brueggemann. They dared to think of better things, and when they spoke out, they faced the consequences of daring to think things that were different than kings and priests. And what Brueggemann seems to get real enjoyment out of is that these prophets came out of nowhere. They didn't have status, they didn't have title. All they said is, the word of the Lord said to me. How do you back that up? How do you check that out? The word of the Lord said to me. I can say the word of the Lord said to me, and then you can say, well, how do we know that? And, or you could say it to me. And I can say, how do you know that? And there was nothing to back it up except for the fact that there was something in that tradition, something in the power of the word, something in their message that conveyed the word of the Lord. And so these prophets, they disrupted society. They had imagination that was, kinda, that was trying to trip up the, uh, that anemic God who was just blessing the temple and the kings. And it wasn't part of any institution. It came unfiltered directly from God. And that's what Brueggemann enjoyed. God is not in the business of just making us comfortable. God is not in the business of just making us institutional. God is in the business of making us better. We're not supposed to be satisfied. We're supposed to be challenged. God doesn't speak through filters. When God speaks, his voice intrudes in our life and is going to make it difficult and change us and challenge us. To follow the anemic God of the status quo, that's not really hard. But to listen to the God of the prophets, to follow the Paul and the Jesus of no excuses, that's difficult. That takes commitment. That takes faith. That's going to ask us as believers and as church to protest when our conscience and even our gut, you know, even if you're not a church person, even your gut should tell us that maybe things can be better than this. 
We can't settle and just be quiet while we wait for the perfect of heaven. We have to be faithful enough to work enough to make things better, even when it's hard. And I want to close with a story that maybe you've heard because I, I put this up on our, our Facebook page as well. It was the, uh, the sermon by Reverend Tracy Blackman at our tri-conference annual meeting. And she tells the story of a Christmas pageant at her church. And I think her church was in Chicago, but I don't remember that for sure. And the Christmas pageant was about to begin. The little boy is on stage. He's supposed to be the lead one to start this whole Christmas pageant with whatever his part was but he's too nervous to say a word. His teacher, just a little bit off stage, is trying to coax him, just say a couple of the words that you trained for that you know, but you know, just do something. And the little boy just stood there silently. Eventually, they had to move past that little boy and continue with the pageant. Then as the pageant was just about to finish, that little boy jumped up from wherever he was, went to center stage, and he read the words, or recited the words, that he was supposed to do at the beginning of the pageant. After the pageant was over, Reverend Blackman, the little boy's pastor, caught up with him in the church hall. She asked him where he found the courage to get back up on that stage and to do the part that just a little while ago he had no courage to do. And the little boy's answer, I thought, was powerful. The little boy told his pastor, I didn't find the courage. I never found the courage. I did it scared. I think that's a pretty cool story. Wisdom from the mouth of babes. He didn't find any courage inside of him. He did it, and he did it scared. That's a cool answer. I did it scared. There's a lot of comfort to be found in church and faith. I don't think I could read tomorrow's newspaper if I didn't have faith, if I didn't have church. It's just too depressing if I didn't have church. But sometimes God is going to ask us to speak out even if we're scared. That's how God gets us to make things better. Perfect is for later. It'd be wonderful if we could do it now, but perfect, I think, is for later. It's, it's for heaven. It can't even be explained to us. But right now, even though it's not easy, even though it's scary, let's let God use us to make things better when we know in our faith and even in our gut that we should be better than this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And I forgot the title of uh, number 434, so I'm going to sneak over here. 434 is God be with you till we meet again.
Um, I want to make sure we're out of here in two more minutes or else I get in trouble. So again, welcome here for one of our summer uh, services at Hatfield Congregational. And uh, know that next week we'll be here again at 9.30. Um, I don't know, with another gift of music. I don't know who it'll be, but it's a nice surprise. And so I would ask you now to turn to our bulletin for our benediction response. Let us go out into the world in the name of the carpenter from Nazareth. Emulate Christ's deeds of compassion with courage. In humility, reach out to help and also to be helped. Travel light with faith as our most cherished resource. As disciples of Jesus Christ, we are blessed and we are able to do more as Christians and church than we ever could hope to be and do on our own. Christ's love surrounds us wherever we are. So, let us then go forth with Jesus as our guide and as our Savior today and always as we strive to change the world for the better.